we can go ahead and get started. Um, some more people will probably be joining us, but that's okay. So hi everyone, my name is Carissa Inglert and I'm an AmeriCorps member serving with Conservation Nebraska's Common Ground Program. I just wanna thank you all so much for being here tonight and attending our environmental justice webinar. I'm personally really excited for this topic. It's something that I think um, is not talked about enough, especially here in our community. So tonight we are hoping to learn more about some of the modern disparities due to historic redlining practices and other environmental injustices that have occurred in Nebraska. Just a couple of reminders for you before we get started. All of you are muted and your cameras are off, so you can't be seen or heard. If you do have any questions for us throughout the presentation, you can feel free to type them into the Q&A box at the bottom and we will go over them at the end. The webinar is being recorded, so if you do end up missing anything, it will be posted on our Conservation Nebraska YouTube channel for a couple weeks down the road. And lastly, there will be a short poll that will pop up on your screen with just a couple of questions for you towards the end of the webinar. And these just help Conservation Nebraska to improve our future webinars and our events. Here with us today are three speakers, Adam Fletcher, Lori Seibel, and Ed Zimmer. And they're going to share a little bit about themselves and their work, and then we will get started with the webinar. So whoever wants to go first. All right, I'll go first. Uh, my name is Adam Fletcher Sassy, and I am the editor and author of NorthOmahaHistory.com. I've written four books about North Omaha's history, including North Omaha History Volumes 1, 2, and 3, as well as uh, Hashtag Omaha Black History, uh, the looking at the past of Omaha, Nebraska's African-American population, including people, places, and events. Um, I've partnered with Preston Love Jr. on several projects now pertaining to Nebraska's African-American history, and I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me today, Chris. Hi, I'm Lori Seibel. I'm the president and CEO of the Community Health Endowment of Lincoln. We're um, a, a fund that provides um, resources back to the community to help it become a healthier place. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about what we've learned um, about how place impacts a person's health and ability to thrive in our community. And I'm Ed Zimmer. I was Lincoln's Historic Preservation Planner in the planning department from 85 to 2020. And one of my subjects of emphasis was African-American history in Lincoln. And since retiring in 2020, I continue to do community historic presentations and we'll talk about historic uh, residential, race residential patterns in Lincoln leading into Lori's uh, present day material. Thank you guys. Now I'll let Adam have time to bring up his presentation. He'll start us off tonight. Whenever you're ready, Adam, you can go ahead. Awesome. Well, again, this, this section of tonight uh, is about Nebraska's Black history in general. Just kind of a quick overview to give us an idea of, of exactly what it is we're talking about. I'm going to set a timer here just to keep me on track. This this is going to go way too fast and nobody is going to be 100% satisfied with everything that you hear. Uh, I'll give this little caveat before I begin. I'm going to pack a lot of information in five minutes. It's not the best presentation habit, but I want to give it to you. Also, if you are sensitive to terms like white supremacy or white flight or racism, uh, you're going to hear them in the next five minutes, if not longer. So brace yourself. Uh, and then finally, I entertain any questions that you might have in the chat or at the end. So let's go. What I did for tonight's presentation, I'm basically going to cover a lot of Black history facts that aren't popular facts in Nebraska. You might already know some of them, you might not, but let's just go at this and see what happens. Uh, the first thing is Black people have been in Nebraska since 1539. That's the year the Estevanico came with the Spanish conquistadors who had enslaved him and brought him into the Nebraska territory as part of their search for Quivera. Modern evidence shows that there were many more Black Nebraskans who were enslaved than traditionally recorded. The first Nebraska history was written by a sympathizer of enslavement, a man named Morton. That's right, the guy in Nebraska City himself. 
Uh, he was way into Nebraska history, uh, but he wrote that Nebraska only had 13 slaves in its entire history of slaveholding. And uh, modern evidence has shown that there were at least 100 and perhaps more uh, in the entire territory before slavery was banned. It took seven years for Nebraska territory to make slavery legal. And uh, there are a couple other caveats to that, but seven years of fighting in the Nebraska Territory Legislature between pro-enslavers and anti-enslavers. African-Americans have lived statewide in Nebraska since the Civil War, and we're going to see what that looks like in a little while. African-Americans have lived statewide. Uh, there have been active campaigns to disenfranchise Black voters in Nebraska since the 1860s. Of course, African-Americans won enfranchisement uh, in 1865. However, uh, there have been in, in Omaha... In 1867, 13 African-American men showed up at the polls to vote. 400 white men showed up to stop them from voting uh, and really send that message. Black people have helped specifically build several cities in Nebraska, including Omaha, Nebraska City, Lincoln, Hastings, Grand Island, Valentine, and more. And it keeps going. Check this out. Nebraska was the first and only state in the United States of America to grant suffrage to black men under a specific mandate from Congress. No other state faced that same treatment. Black-only settlements in Nebraska began emerging in the 1870s. The first Black military chaplain in the U.S. Army served in Nebraska at Fort Robinson, as well as the first Black Medal of Honor awardee in the United States Army. Nebraska Black voters have never been monolithic. There has always been a movement in the opposition party by African Americans uh, in Nebraska politics. Uh, rural, there are several, uh, four rural uh, Nebraska towns that have had notable African-American populations. At least 12 cities in Nebraska have had notable historical Black populations. So it's not just a current phenomenon. It's not something that's a little bit old, but we're talking historical a century or more. At least 51 Nebraska counties have had notable historic Black populations in the past. Uh, there have been five recorded lynchings of Black men in Nebraska. Five, not one, not two, but five. There have been at least, fit, or I'm sorry, there have been 15 African-Americans elected to the Nebraska state legislature. Ernie Chambers was not the first. Housing segregation was formally imposed in Omaha by the U.S. federal government two times. I'm going to explain those later. Almost all Black voters in Nebraska switched from voting Republican to voting Democrat in 1933. Not all of them, but almost all. Senator Ernie Chambers, of course, is the longest serving state senator in Nebraska history, and more than 31,000 Nebraskans have been documented participating in racial violence against African-Americans since 1891. The first African-American man elected to state office in Nebraska was in 1893, and Black-owned farms in, in rural Nebraska mostly emptied out by the 1930s. Black-only settlements in Nebraska were completely gone by 1940. World War II, they were out. Uh, the first African-American man elected to the unicameral Nebraska legislature was John Adams Jr. in 1937. The first African-American woman appointed to the Nebraska legislature was Joanne Maxey in 1977. At least six settlements were established by Black settlers in Nebraska and had only Black residents. Overton, Brownlee, DeWitty, Goose Lake, also called Bliss, Clifton, and Grant. Uh, Eleven counties in Nebraska have never had a recorded Black resident. Now, here's some other facts. I'm going to let you read through all of them, except for the last two. The first Black entrepreneurs in Nebraska started when the territory was established, 1854. And African-American activism in Nebraska recorded, began happening in 1860s. So the entire history of Nebraska has been fulfilled, enriched, and made bigger by African-Americans. It's a documented proof. And uh, that's five minutes about the history of African-Americans in Nebraska. Thank you for sharing that, Adam. Ed, whenever you're ready, go ahead Let's and give this a try. It's that darn share screen sequence. Are you getting it now? We are. Um, if you want to switch the display settings, 
I think that would be great. Okay. I think just up at the top, um, display settings, yep. Mm -hmm. You're getting my notes, aren't you? Yeah. Um, yeah, if you put your cursor to the very top, left yep right yep and then display settings to the one just to the right of that right of it i get mute there you go and then click on display right, now i see it okay thank you there you go mm -hmm. yep swap and then that should be perfect there you go thank you ed okay well i'm going to talk about um, race residence patterns in lincoln um somewhat like adam we need to consider briefly a look at um, overall population um, because this might be a perception of what black history in Lincoln. Um, the red line here is total population in the first 70 so years of Lincoln history, um, climbing steeply in the first couple decades um, to a peak about 55,000, 1890, sharp decline in the crash, depression of the 1890s, and then a slower steady growth since 1900. The African-American population on this chart is the blue line at the bottom. And you might say, what blue line at the bottom? And what we have to do uh, is focus um, on information we, we want to separate from the overall. Um, if we look at everything at once, we, we can miss a lot of detail. And if we take away the red line and look just at the African-American population in Lincoln, uh, we start, we disaggregate the data, um, um, take away the overall. And there is a similar pattern of sharp growth of the African American population in Lincoln from 1870 to 1890 to a peak of about 1400, and then a sharp decline in that tough times of the 1890s. And this disadvantaged population economically doesn't rebound as quick in the early 20th century. That 1400 number though is comparable to a great number of the county seats of Nebraska in 1890, places that want everybody would expect would have a town history with churches and clubs and families. And that was the case within the black population in Lincoln as well. So it's a, it's a small town within a growing somewhat larger Midwestern city. We've done some work to try to identify the locations of African-American families in the early 20th century, or the late 19th, early 20th century in Lincoln. And this map would show us um, an 1881 residential pattern, not totally accurate, but it's drawn out of the city directories that up until the 1920s identified individuals by race. And we've gone through all of the city directories um, at selected years from the 1880s to the 1920s to identify essentially an African-American directory within the larger um, population, and then have been able to map where those families lived. And what we see generally in the late 19th and early 20th century is a pattern where poor people lived among poor people. Um, and um, looking here at O Street cutting through the center of the city, downtown um, centered between the capital um, and O and a little bit above O, and Black families living uh, south, west, and north, a little bit east of downtown, but where other um, poor families, particularly um, off that cluster of families to the southwest, that was African-American families living among the German from Russian immigrants in the neighborhood called South Bottoms. Um, but there was not a um, segregation so much by race, in the late 19th, early 20th century as by economics. Um, and the employment opportunities for black families were very restricted. Um, so you were poor, but could live where other poor people lived. Moving up to about 1910, we, that pattern persists. Um, we start to see some larger concentrations east of downtown, 
um, in what becomes the segregated black neighborhood um, just east of the university north of O Street. Um, but we're not really seeing the segregation pattern, um, it's still economic segregation um, rather than racial segregation um, in the first couple decades of the 20th century. We can even identify some of the individual residences of black families in Lincoln uh, near downtown. This is a family living on South 9th Street, right next to a dry cleaner. Um, this postcard view and the um, John Johnson, early black photographer in Lincoln view, um, click in beside each other side by side. Family living in this house uh, were supported working in downtown hotels as waiters. That was often uh, the occupational pattern we would see and sometimes the, the steadiest um, employment. So this family, uh, the, G the Gale Brace, standing in front of their little brick house at 727, looks pretty grand in a way, um, beautifully dressed, great big hats. This is the house. It was a tiny little brick structure um, and still stands today. And we can put that photograph right onto that front porch um, about 1910 or 1915. Thomas family lived in South Bottoms um, among the German from Russian families. Um, they become a, a very well-established Omaha family. Um, Thomas Funeral Home was this, this family's um, establishment in later years. And that's Lon Thomas with his kids or his kids at the time that uh, Lon and his wife were running a tiny little grocery store in their living room after he had been badly burned in a crash on the Burlington Railroad. These photos um, tried to identify the individuals and the locations um, because they might give a view um, that you might think this woman must have means. She's um, beautifully presented in a wonderful dress and a great big hat. Over her head, reading an address, you get 915 and looking at our city, looking at our directories and our city Sanborn maps, 915 is a little tiny house on an unpaved U Street. The parallel lines running by it are railroad tracks. This is just north of um, Haymarket area day. Actually, this would be under the parking garage west of the uh, Memorial Stadium. Streets unpaved. Uh, there's a junkyard beside this little house. In fact, there's an iron, a lead smelter just south of her house across the alley. Uh, Mamie Griffin is the lady in the picture. Uh, she's a cook at the some of the fraternity houses and her husband's also a cook. The occupations are restricted. Um, the housing is not patterned yet um, by race, um, but the opportunities are small. In Lincoln, we start to see race restrictions in deeds on properties in 1916, um, south of downtown, a little bit to the east in what we call Sheridan Boulevard neighborhood. Harvey Rathbone um, plats the second portion of Sheridan Boulevard that'd be east of 27th Street, south of South. Um, Rathbone was a realtor, a graduate of UNL. He had actually been a assistant football coach in his early teens, um, 19 teens years at UNL. Um, here, here he is in the yearbook when he was assistant football coach. One of his star players at that time would have been Clinton Ross, um, this African-American graduate of Lincoln High School. Clinton goes on to become the first black law graduate, uh, male law graduate of the University of Nebraska, serves as an officer in World War I, can't get employment as an attorney in Lincoln and moves to LA, um, and actually is involved in real estate investment there as well. Uh, but the pattern employment was restricted, education was open, and I think education was a big attractor for African-American families to Lincoln but your kids might not stay if they, if they got an advanced degree of any kind. We add some additional um, platted areas with race restrictions, a little area um, south of uh, A Street and east of Antelope Creek called Washington Heights in 1917. This is an area of very modest houses, it's not the big houses of Sheridan Boulevard, but was restricted against Africans, Chinese, and Japanese um, by the deeds um, of purchase after 1917. The um, further east, the um, Piedmont area, 
another area rather like Sheridan, large lots, big houses, uh, and with, had racial restrictions. Uh, both the Rathbone portion of Sheridan and Piedmont used language saying that only members of the Caucasian race could reside on the properties, except for servants of, for the families residing therein. Trying to move our uh, race patterns of residents up into the um, middle third of the 20th century. Um, here we're mapping by wards, those election districts uh, in 1930. And the concentration um, is of African-American families starts to become north of downtown and somewhat east of downtown, although there are quite a few families down along South 9th Street as well. But many of the, the wards of the city in 1930 had one or two or no black residents. And that's the time that we start to see the systematic application then in the 1930s of WPA policy um, that is referred to as redlining. Uh, towns, um, bankers and realtors were um, urged in towns to give back to the federal uh, homeowner loan corporation maps showing uh, their town uh, organized, and this is by color. Um, the lightest blue was the most desirable. Uh, the darker blue was called still desirable. Um, yellow was the questionable neighborhoods, and the red were those that were called hazardous, which then happened to be the neighborhoods where uh, African Americans were largely concentrated. Not so much by those race restrictions, which were in neighborhoods uh, where Black families wouldn't have had the means to buy, um, but rather this is um, putting into the map, putting in place in the loan policies of the federal government and the banks. Uh, where families could, could borrow money um, and the African-American neighborhoods were not neighborhoods you could borrow money in typically. Um, here, um, assigning the numbers uh, to those wards of residents and um, then looking at uh, percentage uh, in the various neighborhoods. I want to focus then on one neighborhood, um, what we call the Brown Belt neighborhood south of um, Everett or Randolph Elementary School. In 1925, um, the school was built and the first uh, residential, new residential section in that neighborhood was platted with no race restrictions in 1925. 1937, uh, when the um, Federal Housing Authority is starting to loan money, um, we get then race restrictions in this neighborhood of really quite modest um, working class, what we might today call workforce housing, um, but we're seeing race restrictions imposed by Mr. Brown, who's developing much of the area. Uh, and each of these then subsequent additions up till 46, uh, he's imposing race restrictions right in line with the federal uh, policies. Uh, the federal government did not created these maps so they were loaning money, what they saw as desirable neighborhoods and desirable meant racially homogenous in the federal terminology. A couple of additional areas then, uh, brown built I've indicated in one of the pink arrows, and then I find a little cluster of covenants appearing um, down at the south edge of the city, east of the country club, on areas that had already been long platted, but neighbors got together and and imposed on their vacant land the kind of race restrictions so they would be eligible for FHA mortgages. In the Brown Belt neighborhood, I actually have the uh, building documents for those small houses. This is one of uh, Mr. Brown's little houses. These documents are stamped with the FHA stamp of approval. They've met the requirements of the federal uh, mortgages. And these are quite modest. Um, small frame and um, sometimes brick or limestone veneered houses of the late 30s and early 40s um, with the, the federal lending policy behind them um, that they, the areas be race restricted. So we find that embedded. It, it isn't so much that the race, that the red line maps shaped the um, residential pattern, but 
what had been there as a dispersed pattern of residence for black families where other poor families lived becomes then a, a concentrated uh, segregated push into the most restricted areas which then had poor housing um, because you couldn't borrow money to, typically to buy or improve the housing in those areas. That's what I've got for you. And I will end my share and turn it over to Lori. Great, thank you, Ed. Always fascinating things. And thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Um, my job is to really talk about um, the more contemporary issues and what some of these restrictive policies in the past and the redlining has done to our current community. And we really um, began this process back in 2015 when we asked ourselves the question, does it matter where you live in Lincoln in terms of your ability to have good health, um, to live um, out of poverty, um, those kinds of questions. And we really wanted to know, does place matter? So we began mapping our community. We began mapping data. And we, be, we did that in 2015, then in 2017, 2019. And this is the fourth iteration in 2021. And we actually have um, the uh, draft maps of our 2023 uh, um, map book, as we call it, which will be coming out shortly. So what you're going to be seeing today is slightly dated. Most of it is pre-COVID, but um, I can probably assure you that things are not probably um, any better post-COVID than they were pre-COVID. In fact, I know some things um, are certainly not. So we get started with the idea of poverty. And I call poverty the cause of causes. It's really what defines a neighborhood because you're not going to often see poverty or you'll never see poverty without other issues that come along with that. This particular map is, is Lincoln. And I want to give you just a quick, for those of you who aren't Lincolnites, um, can you see my cursor? Okay. Good. Okay. This is 20, um, this is 48th and 20, I'm sorry, 27th and O right here. And so this is a map of Lincoln. The blue outlines are what the city limits were in 1980. And of course, the light blue are what you'll see when this map uh, was most recently done in 2021. We've removed some census tracts from this. There are 70 census tracts in Lincoln, and we we've, we've removed four of them. That would include the airport, the university, our regional center, which is um, houses people with severe and persistent mental illness, and then our, um, our prison. Let me stop that for just a second. And um, well, let me play that again. I think it's, it's important for you to see it as it moves until today. Let me play that. I'm going to just start that slide again, because I think it's important for you to see how things have morphed over time. So this began in 1980, and you'll see where things are red, where things are orange and yellow, poverty is, a, is at a higher level in those particular places. So if we begin to morph this till today, you'll see that poverty has expanded um, in every direction from our core. Um, certainly, it is limited, however, to the core. And this is the place where a lot of the redlining took place, um, as Ed has talked about. As we move to today, um, we find that there are now two census tracts in our community, of which there are over 50% of individuals who are living in poverty. So we're seeing more poverty, we're seeing it more dispersed, but certainly it remains in the core. And there are um, historical reasons for that, which we'll be talking about. So why does uh, poverty real, really matter? Well, a lot of it is because it was created through policies um, of which Ed has already talked about. Um, chief among them was the Homeowners Loan Corporation maps of nearly every community of a significant size across the country, which really guided the banks on who they could lend money to. And when individuals cannot borrow money to buy a home, that cuts off a lot of things from that family, including certainly generational wealth, which leads to a person's ability to work them their way out of poverty. And so what we saw were, um, as those individuals, low-income and people of color, were shut out of the suburban housing market, 
the white residents moved there, they bought houses, they built wealth in the form of health equity. And essentially those white citizens accumulated advantage while people in poverty and people of color then accumulated disadvantage. But I think it's also important to point out that this segregating housing also isolated people of different races and ethnicities from each other. It essentially caused them to live apart from each other. It forced them to live apart. And we'll, you see that in many communities, and it certainly has not allowed um, cultures to begin the process of assimilation in a, in a way that perhaps um, would allow um, our communities to look different today in a lot of, in a lot of different ways. So what does it really matter when people live in poverty? I mean, I think, I think we can say most communities have places where this happens, but what, let's begin to look at some of the things that poverty brings along, along with it. In this particular case, we looked at where poverty was 30 to 60%. And by poverty, I mean the, the federal guidelines. So it's about $25,000 a year for a family of four that would be considered to be living in poverty. And we'll see in these census tracts right here, 30 to 60% of people meet that definition. If I look in this blue areas, less than 5% of people would meet that definition of poverty. So let's just look at life expectancy, how long people can expect to live um, if they live in these various uh, places. Our life expectancy here in the core is 72.3 years. And out here it's 81.8 years. So there's about a 10 year difference in life expectancy by virtue of where you live. So does place matter? I think for those of us who value that 10 years, we would say um, that it does. But of course, there's a lot of reasons for that poverty and there's a lot of reasons that poverty can affect people who live there. It's not simply about poverty alone. Um, if we look at where people uh, live in poverty at above average. Our poverty rate in 2019 was 12.5%. This is the part of Lincoln where more than 12.5% of people live in, in poverty. What about if we look where our minority population lives? You see a very, very similar area of the community. And now if I overlap that, this purple area represents where both of those things are happening at the same time. Now, here's a key fact that I think is really important to consider. That is that if you look at the areas where minority population is above average, there was 41 of those census tracts. 83% of those also have higher than average poverty rates. So of those that have a higher than average minority population, 83% of them also have a higher than average poverty rate. What does that tell us? That tells us that people, people of color are more likely to live in poverty. That's just a fact. The data says that is an absolute fact. And so being able to disconnect that is important. Getting out of generational poverty is certainly one way to do that. And that means recognizing some of the policies that cause that generational po poverty to take place and disrupting that cycle are going to be key. And certainly when we look at the projected um, population by race over the next uh, 30 years, we understand why we have to disconnect those things. Back in 1990, this was the, our white population in Lincoln, and that was our uh, population of people of color. Let's move till today. We'll see it's about 80, 20, 80% to 20%, growing obviously. Let's look at another 30 years. And we'll see that people of color will represent more than one third of our population. So if we do not disconnect living in poverty and being a person of color, our communities are simply going to have more poverty. And so that is why this is key. It's key to our future. It's key to the future of our, our kids. It's, it's important to the future of all of us that we really began begin to think about how to undo policies, how to rectify these policies, but how to cause people to thrive when they've not had an opportunity to do that. This affects really so many things. Let's look at first trimester prenatal care, women who get care when they're pregnant um, in the first three months. We know that that's key to having healthy babies. And if you have a healthy baby, you're more likely to have a healthy child and a healthy adult. If you don't have free first, good first trimester care, your chances of having a healthy baby go down. So it's critical to us that we should do that. 
Our goal in Lincoln is that 90% of women would get care in the first trimester. Um, this map will show us that we haven't accomplished that in a single census tract. Uh, we've been able to do it in the green areas up to 89%. But if we look here in the orange, we're, we're seeing that there are um, 30 to 40% of women who are not getting care in the first trimester. This little red area right here tells us that 40 to 50% of women are not getting first trimester care. So these maps become very important when you're trying to change things. It's not as if we don't know. It's not as if we don't know what we need to do. We need to go to these census tracts starting in the areas where the problems are the most intractable and do deep, important work. Because as I said, these maps tell us a story. And um, just as the redlining map tells us a story, these maps tell us a story, but they also help us understand where we can focus our limited resources and do things better. Let's even look at things like healthy food access, being able to go into neighborhoods to provide healthy food where they're not able to purchase any at the stores in those areas. Or if we look at children being able to pass the PACER test, again, these are in these areas that are highly affected by intergenerational poverty. And let me tell you, this map was done before to, um, the COVID pandemic, and this map is going to look worse now. And if I look at any map that can say to me that children today are going to live shorter lives than we live, this is probably it. It says that kids today cannot are not aerobically fit at, in some cases, a very high rate. We look at some of these areas that were defined by red, redlining, and you'll see that 40 to 50 percent of these kids are not passing an aerobic fitness test. And that does not bode well for their ability to grow and thrive and be healthy the rest of their lives. And of course, much of this is rooted in poverty, not being able to have healthy food, not being able to participate in sports of which they cannot afford, not having safe areas in which to play, not having parents who are able to um, both be home with them during certain times, not working double shifts to be able to be outside with them. There's, uh, there's many reasons for that. But this is the kind of thing that should make us move into action. And I do wanna talk about kids for just a second because um, adverse childhood experiences or ACEs as we call them is really important research that we have to pay attention to when we're thinking about the long-term effects of not only um, redlining, but in many respects, what's still happening in some of these communities. This tells us and the research tells us that there is a relationship between the kind of adult you are in terms of the behaviors you will partake in and the kind of disease you will have and what you were exposed to as a child, the abuse and household dysfunction you had as a child. The more likely you are to have lived in poverty, to not have enough food to eat, to perhaps have some kind of um, abuse or neglect in your home is directly related to what kind of uh, a life you will live the rest of your life in, man in many, many cases. And the research on this is strong. In fact, it says that if you had no ACEs as a child, you lived a very idyllic childhood, there will still be people who smoke and people who are alcoholic, people who will use IV drugs or have heart disease or attempt suicide. But let's look at a child who has seven ACEs, one who is living in poverty with perhaps neglect, um, with uh, dysfunction of a, of a kind often driven by poverty. We'll see those statistics change dramatically. As an adult, one in six will smoke, one in six will be alcoholic, one in 30 will use IV drugs, one in six will have heart disease, and one in five attempt suicide. So being able to continue to move the needle to create neighborhoods of which people can thrive is so important to, to all of our communities today. So we do know there is a relationship. This, this map shows us that what was happening back in uh, 1933, the way that this system was set up to really uh, um, cause people not to invest in their families and their homes mm -hmm. is still pervasive in many of those areas today. And so this takes uh, um, very intentional and very deep work. It cannot be done with one program. It cannot be done with one grant or, or one organization. It has to be intentional and it has to be accomplished by people throughout the community, regardless of where they live. So I always say at the end, so what, what do we have to do? 
Um, and I think part of it is we have to have these difficult conversations. It's not easy. Uh, Adam started his by saying, I'm going to say some words that may not be comfortable to people, mm -hmm. but they are difficult conversations. And uh, they have to be, we have to assume that that's a place to start. Mm -hmm. In all of this, we have to think about the weight of poverty. We cannot address any single issue that's happening, whether it be mental illness or substance abuse or domestic violence or um, any of those kinds of issues if we do not think about how in all of this we can lift the weight of poverty. I believe we have to embrace the significance of brain science. We have to think about what um, has happened to individuals because of the lives that they have led. And we have to think about how to stop that from happening. And that takes all of us as a community. For example, we start really investing in kids really dramatically when they enter school. We invest well in our schools. We're very proud of our schools. Um, we, we pay teachers, um, you know, not as much as they deserve, but we pay them certainly a living wage. We invest in the buildings and in the facilities and in the programs. But what's happening to kids before the age of five? Who is wrapping their arms around those kids? Certainly some kids, and again, it's usually kids of means who are having um, opportunities to participate in robust preschool programs, but not every um, family can do that. In fact, in Lincoln right now, the cost of paying for a year of childcare is equal to paying for a year of sending your child to the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And how can we continue to do that and at the same time not invest in the early childcare workforce? Uh, in Lincoln, we'll find often that people can make more money working um, at, as a barista or working in a fast food restaurant than they can taking care of a child in childcare. And that is somehow our culture has shifted away from the idea of how to value that work um, and how to recognize the value of brain science. This has to happen with public-private partnerships. Um, sometimes I think we think government can fix everything and I think we all would agree that's not the case. And so we have to begin to look about, at how private and public can work together to address some of these issues. And then ultimately I think, and probably I'm singing to the choir here because many of you would not be at this um, event if you didn't have a deep interest in the topic of how to really do something to change and make a community better. So there has to be that willingness to act. So at the end of the day, the question was, does place matters? And we learned that it does, and it continues to, to do that. But we also are armed with some very powerful tools. And that includes our history, and that includes what we've learned from it. But it also includes things like this maps that tell us what we need to do next. And so that would be my encouragement to you is wherever you live, to learn as much as you can about that place, and then to invest in the places that need it. Thank you so much for sharing that, Lori. Those are some graphics that I've never seen before. So I really appreciate that you had those for us. You're welcome. Adam, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and share your presentation as well. All right. Is it showing, Carissa? I'm still seeing that it's loading, but now it's loaded. Oh, here we go. Okay. It says my screen sharing is paused. I love new messages on Zoom if you're not used to them. It's all right, cool, new things. All right, so um, uh, my name is still Adam, and I want to give a little bit more background. First, I want to say uh, how honored I am to be able to share this space with Ed and Lori, Carissa. Thank you you so much for putting it together. It's a little bit humbling for me to be uh, kind of in the same space as Ed and Lori, who are obviously scientists and professionals who really get this on a deep level. Um, I am a mudflinger. Uh, I was, I grew up in the Miller Park neighborhood of North Omaha in the 80s and 90s. And uh, I've made a career for myself outside of this realm uh, as a, a trainer and, and advocate for youth engagement, because that's what saved my life growing up in North Omaha. Uh, had some, I, I scored pretty high on the aces and had a lot of opportunity to become intimately acquainted uh, with the challenges facing poverty because I grew up in it. Um, that said, uh, NorthOmahaHistory.com is my attempt to return 
some of all of the things that were given to me when I was growing up. So this presentation that you've heard so far from me and what's coming ahead, this is driven by my interest. This is me trying to cram together a couple of things that I never saw in the neighborhood growing up. I've never seen from Omaha in general. I've seen it in other cities across the country where I've lived and I'm anxious and, and desiring to bring it back to the place that affected me so much. This quote from James Baldwin is one of those things. American history is longer, larger, more various, more beautiful, and more terrible than anything anyone has ever said about it. So to begin this section on Omaha's Black history, I want to just open up with that quote because I think it's really important to put into context what we're about to see. The other thing that I want to say is that I'm just a goofy white guy. Um, honestly, I'm a Canadian immigrant to boot. Uh, and from that perspective, this is a flawed presentation. Uh, I am at very best a tourist. I am a, a bit of a searcher. I am definitely an advocate. Uh, who is trying to teach people about Omaha's Black history from the audacious place of somebody who wants to rather than somebody who owns it or belongs to it. So if you see wrong things in this presentation, if you feel agitated or upset, uh, if you're a person who identifies as a person of color, please correct me. Please show me the way. I'm going to learn from what Ed and Lori have already said. That's just blowing my mind. So that's pretty cool. But as we go through here, check it out. Let me know what you think. The first thing that I want to do is pop this open by saying that there are some eras to Omaha's Black history. One of the dilemmas of Black history is that white people tend to oversimplify it. We just want to boil it down to the lowest common denominator, make it a simple thing. Generally, we focus on one of two things when we tell Black history, when white people tell Black history. We either focus on how wonderful Black people are, and we make every African American out to have ever been as being wonderful and great people. And true, every one of them has been a person and every one of them has lived lives. Uh, however, African-Americans are not monoliths. They aren't just one thing. They're very complex and sophisticated. And again, being a goofy white guy on the outside looking in, uh, it's important to me to recognize this sophistication. But the other thing that we do is we focus on the bad side. So we either focus on the great stuff, sports players and entertainers and black leaders, or we focus on the bad stuff. And frankly, it's a little bit challenging to break out of those two things. So I'm going to kind of pose both of them at the same time by telling you that there is an antebellum Omaha, Omaha before the Civil War was, Oma, was over. And lots of people pin that to 1865 uh, and everything before that. We can go back, like I mentioned early on, 1549, Estevanico was an African man who was with the Spanish when they came to Nebraska. There were Blacks in Nebraska all the way up until the territory was opened in 54. Black Mormons who were traveling with the Mormons as enslaved people uh, there were black fur trappers. The founder of Chicago, a man whose last name was Pondu Sable, uh, he actually lived in North Omaha in 1810. So this fascinating history that goes way back, antebellum Omaha, the Reconstruction era, that was after the S Civil War in 1865, all the way around 1877, the numbers flux a little bit, but African-Americans began this political identity, this economic identity, and they built social capacity like never before. And then the Harlem Renaissance, you know, it's called a couple of different things by different people, but for the sake of kind of putting into the context of what was happening around the country, the Harlem Renaissance wasn't just about Harlem. It wasn't just about New York City. It was also about Omaha and Lincoln and Hastings and other cities where there were black populations and black people really stepping in front and creating the art, the culture that really drove the era. Jazz, of course, came out of the black community but so did so much more, music and poetry and films. Omaha was the home of the very first ever black film company in the United States or worldwide. Omaha, Nebraska, North Omaha, George and his brother, Noble Johnson, they were right there in Omaha doing this work as part of that Harlem Renaissance era. But the other thing that popped up in this era was activist resistance and black people really working together for not just the first time, but for the most consolidated time ever to say, we want civil rights, we want human rights, we deserve them, we are Americans. And then this piece, number four, white supremacy and white flight. Of course, they've been present in Nebraska since before the territory was established, present all the way through the Harlem Renaissance, lynchings, criminal pressure, and uh, this whole entire piece of abandoning North Omaha. Then there was thick community development, social, religious, and economic entrenchment where the Black community really began to rally together, draw together the community for the purpose of strengthening the community. Social upheaval followed that. White people, in particular, the government focused on a policy of benign neglect and then urban renewal and desegregation. 
uh, of course, only forced on Nebraska by the United States Supreme Court. But hey, wherever it came from, desegregation took a firm stance at one point. But then apparent apathy set in. Now, remember that this history that I'm going to share only goes through 2000, and a radical thing is happening right now. But we'll get to that next in the next presentation. But for this part, uh, let's jump in here and take a look. I want to introduce, before we go any further, the reality that African Americans lived throughout Omaha in all of Omaha's existence, especially early on. Blacks lived in the downtown core as we understand it today, but there has been housing segregation since the jump, since the beginning of the city. When people refer to the near north side, the near north side is a pejorative term, or at least it was seen like that at the end of the 1970s, when Black people didn't want to be isolated to one community and they didn't want to be labeled as one residential feature. So they said, don't call it the near north side anymore. I'm, re I'm resurrecting this term for the purpose of this historical analysis. If you look on my hand-drawn map, it's jankity, I tried. Uh, it says first, the first area where African-Americans were concentrated in Omaha that I could find through my research, looking on historical newspapers and other sources uh, from that very first decade of the city's existence was way down there at Dodge and 16th Street in this little region. Uh, it was just a couple of blocks. African-Americans lived in pro close proximity to the dirtiest industries and to the dirtiest work in Omaha. Early on, uh, Black people were setting up barber shops, uh, blacksmiths, and they had a lot of different jobs, but in the very isolated service sector. Uh, but they lived next to much dirtier industries, including the railroads as they came in, including uh, Asarco, the big lead processing, and of course the Union Pacific and other features, which you could see uh, echoed in where it says second, and that second area the black population began to expand and move along. Now, this doesn't mean that only black people lived in that area. They were racially uh, mixed because there were white people living there. But at that point, the white people who lived in these areas were ide not identified as white. They were seen as something separate. They were treated as less than the white population, which was generally seen in this time, in this antebellum and post antebellum era, it was seen as a Northern European phenomenon. You were English, you were French, you might have been a little Scandinavian, you might have been German, but for the most part, anybody who wasn't identified as that lived down here in this area, south of Cumming Street, north of Dodge, and they were clustered together. However, the Black community was only allowed to live inside of this area. Again, there were some deviations, but for the most part, for the generalization, this is what the near north side looked like. Then the second and third block, you can see that it's expanding. The community begins growing. That yellow area that jolts up is echoed then in number four, um, the fourth area. This is uh, what they referred to as the near north, north, near north side all the way into the 1930s and 40s. And then uh, the near north side reached its uh, apex when it got to Locust Street and expanded over to about 30th, 30th 33rd in there. Uh, and the long story short is this is what is referred to the, as the near north side before the term was banned. Now, this is really important for housing segregation and to call it out because this is where the majority of African Americans lived in Omaha. Not just the, they're not the only place, but um, definitely the majority. Now, when we look on, we can begin to see what this housing segregation looked like over the years. I don't have the statistical data. I don't have the beautiful GIS maps, Lori, nice maps. Those were cool. Um, However, what we can see is this historical data that begins to show anecdotally and uh, with numbers that the black population has been segregated for a long time in Omaha. You can see on the map that, that is showing the minority population. This map was taken from a 1972 report on the inter develop of interstates in Omaha, and in particular, the siting of the North Freeway. And you can see the concentration of African Americans south of Ames Avenue is at 75% and over, meaning that Blacks lived almost exclusively in that region between um, Charles and Ames as it was identified for the purpose of citing the North Freeway. We can also see an advertisement here from the 1904 Omaha World Herald for colored housing. Uh, Omaha had strict housing guidelines and strict behaviors around its housing. Lots of people will talk about this de facto segregation in Omaha. Of course, the two differences being de jure and de facto. I am no expert on this. I default to Palma Joy Strand and her spectacular work on redlining in Omaha. If you haven't looked that up, you'll, you need to. Um, but uh, early evidence of housing segregation in Omaha starts to arrive at the turn of the century of the 20th century. 1898 is an early ad, 1910, 
this ad right here, you can see very clearly, these houses are specifically designated for African-American families. All of these addresses are located uh, in the near north side community that I identified early on. The other two things that I have here, a couple of pieces, uh, this article that mentions the Black Belt in Omaha, this was published on September 30th, 30th of, of 1919. Uh, this is the time right after the lynching of Will Brown happened. Uh, the lynching of Will Brown was a uh, extrajudicious behavior by a mob of 20,000 white Omahans who took Will Brown from the Omaha uh, Douglas County Courthouse in downtown Omaha, the current building that still stands today. They took him from there and they lynched him outside of the courthouse, burnt his corpse and sold pieces of the rope to the crowd to make sure that everybody had a memento as they walked away. The other piece that happened is that that mob turned north towards the black neighborhood and sought to uh, burn down the African-American neighborhood. The military stopped them. This article is specific to say that, hey, we're going to open it back up and everybody's going to have a good time again in the black. This is a mess. This whole situation is terrible. Again, I owe the map in the middle of this to Palma Joy Strand, who actually went to Washington, D.C. and dug it out uh, physically and then shared this graphic. But uh, you can see my interpretation of this map to the left in the section that's marked D in red in North Omaha. Now, you could see the large D in South Omaha. Uh, that was specific to the stockyards and kind of that phenomenon of the stockyards. You can also see other D section uh, in between South Omaha and North Omaha, it's a small part um, that, that's around a railroad where other African Americans lived. But the large concentration lived in that North Omaha sec segment. Now, before, and that was 1936 when this map was introduced to Omaha's real estate community, it was formalizing something that everybody already knew. Because all the way back in 1919, the U.S. Army had mandated that the city's black belt was, oh, right there to the left already existed in the near north side. So this housing segregation was formalized by the federal government in 1936, but introduced in 1919 and had been ongoing informally before. So Omaha has a long and complicated history of the segregation, but it's not just about housing. And this is that important context that Lori began to really unpack in depth. And all that I'm gonna do is skim it. I'm just gonna tell you, intersectionality is real. Housing is the top of that segregation list, but we can see jobs and careers, recreation opportunities. In the 1920s, they were talking about North Omaha having a recreation desert. It appeared again in the 1960s as one of the cause of the riots that happened in 66, 68, 69. Religious segregation, healthcare segregation. North Omaha was home to more than 12 hospitals before 1919. After 1919, they started leaving the last one left Oh, just a few years ago when Creighton's Hospital formally closed and they opened up a medical facility that's for the neighborhood, but the hospital is gone now. Police brutality has been constant in North Omaha because of the color of people's skins, not because of where they live, but isolated because of the housing segregation. Education, the school to prison pipeline is real. Culture transportation, the social safety net, access to healthy foods, all of these things and those beautiful maps that Lori introduced for Lincoln, we can see them in North Omaha, we can see them in Omaha as a city and begin to understand where some of this is coming from and where it's going. In the next section, I'm going to impact what some of that looks like in modern times. But take a note that one of the pieces worth mentioning here is this environmental racism that is at the core of so many of your work uh, and so much of what you all do. This history of lead poisoning in Omaha, I wrote and summarized a lot of the data that hadn't been brought together into one final piece. But alas, I brought it together. And what I'm featuring right here is a map from the Omaha World Herald that shows remediation sites as of 2018. But you'll notice that all of these are drawn in when you look at the large cluster of places that were involved in the EPA's Superfund site uh, for ASARCO and the other lead poisoning in Omaha, you'll see that the majority of the clustering is in North Omaha in the African-American neighborhood. None of these things are coincidental. That lineup becomes really obvious. If you're searching the internet at the same time that we're hanging out here, search uh, uh, hashtag Omaha Black History on Instagram or Facebook, and you'll see hundreds of other articles and sources. All of these pictures here, I mentioned none of them as I went along. And this is the history of Black, some of the tiny bit of history of Black people in North Omaha. And that's the first part of what I'm going to talk about. Chrissy, do you want to introduce the next part, or should I just jump in? Um, you can go ahead if you want to. That's fine. Sure. Cool. 
All right. So the second part then is this question of contemporary issue. Now, Lori covered these with such sophistication, there's no way that I could possibly touch that. Uh, and you'll all find this to be a superficial and easy kind of skim over the top. But for the sake of saying it, here's James Baldwin again. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. And that's why this conversation is so important. Uh, there are plenty of people in Omaha who could do this conversation a lot more effectively than me. But from my own uh, research and evidence that I found, first I want to mention a documentary that's forthcoming. It's called Divisible, and it's all about the history of redlining in Nebraska and its current presence in Omaha and what's happening in the city. But notice one of these graphics from their presentation is that one in 20 Nebraskans identify as Black. Now, for the sake of saying that, that's a number. But here's the reality. This is called the racial dot map, and it was first conceived about a decade ago uh, from a university on the East Coast. But we can see clearly here the basis of the racial dot map is um, racial identities according to the United States Census. So this is as formal as these identities can get as people want to self-identify. On this map, yellow represents African-Americans, blue represents Hispanic Latinos. Every other color, red actually represents Asian Americans. Um, and you can see that every other dot represents white. This is a clear example of what that segregation looks like. But what I've done here is created a separate graphic because I wanted to talk about this notion of white flight. I think that white flight dovetails into this conversation about housing segregation very clearly. In Omaha, there have been several phases of housing development. Uh, we think of these urban designers, and Ed, correct me if I'm wrong, but urban designers and planners think about these as concentric circles, generally speaking, that usually you have a downtown core. And in that downtown core, uh, you have the oldest part of the city. Generally speaking, across the United States, this holds true. But in Omaha, what's happened with the physical barrier of the Missouri River is that white people have successively moved further and further west away from the downtown core recently reclaiming some parts of it for white people to live in again, uh, but for the most part, spreading across the entirety of Douglas County, Sarpy County, and the surrounding region. In this racial isolation, they've moved, we've moved further and further west and north and south and away from the Hispanic Latinx community and away from the African American community. I put some dates relative to the foundation of these different neighborhoods, communities, uh, just to give us a sense of what it is that, that this white flight can look like. 1854, Omaha was founded. You know, the, the popular story is a picnic on the hillside at Central High School before the school was there, of course, before the Capitol was there. It was called Capitol Hill. But they had a picnic there, the founders did, and they said, hey, let's put Omaha City here. They were all East Coast uh, wealthy people who were trying to make another buck. You know, they were investors, real estate scheme people. And they lived over in Council Bluffs. They saw that hill over there and they said, we're going to do something with that. So they got Omaha going 1854. Now, North Omaha already existed before they founded the city of Omaha. That's right, because the city of Florence uh, was actually established in 1846 by Mormon pioneers who came through. So there was already an infrastructure, both a civic infrastructure in terms of streets were laid out and fit uh, a built environment in terms of old houses and businesses that already existed there and that were already operating when the territory opened, by the way. Well, that picked up. It was established as the city of Florence. Also, we have the old fur trading posts that were to the north that were closed down by the time that Omaha was founded, but there's still remnants, traces of population and different people involved with that. North Omaha grew. 1854, and I can break down the concentric circles within North Omaha, but the long story short is it grew so much until 1919. 1919 was really a turning point for the entire North Omaha community because white people fled en masse from the old parts of North Omaha. And here we're I'm talking primarily about the near north side uh, with the white mob charging of 20,000 people charging the near north side. White people didn't feel safe living there among African Americans anymore and they readily surrendered their houses. They moved out to new neighborhoods. Dundee and uh, Happy Hollow were a couple of those neighborhoods that they moved to. They moved south, they moved a little bit to the north, but for the most part uh, they moved to areas like Fair Acres which is out towards 60th and beyond to 72nd north of Dodge. And Fair Acres really is, represents that wealth that moved out of North Omaha. Oh I didn't mention that. North Omaha was built with mansions and uh, fancy estates belonging to wealthy people. They all bailed. They all went out west. 
that was really that first concentric circle that blew up the city of Omaha. Uh, when I-680 went in in 1966, that growth continued to the West. And then of course, West Omaha opened up proper past 90th Street in 1972. And it's just continued its charge West for the last 50 years. So we really get the sense that white flight has driven these things along. Eric Ewing is the executive director of the Great Plains Black History Museum. He was quoted in the Divisible film as saying, we know that these things have existed. We know that these things have been a part of the fiber of America for a hundred years, and yet we've done very little to address or make changes. Eric is absolutely undeniably right because we have ongoing segregation today. We've tried. Work of Lori and Ed and folks like that are definitely fighting this segregation. There are so many different activists who are uh, doing radical things within Omaha, powerful things, systemic things to make that change real. But in reality, it's slow going. I put a comparison, a pair of comparison photos in here. I recently came across this image of North 24th and Nicholas Streets in 1939. In 1939, 24th and Nicholas was the dead center of the near north side in Omaha. Black businessmen uh, worked up and down the street with Jewish businessmen and Scandinavian businessmen, all of whom had businesses lining the street. There was a little Italy in North Omaha at this point. There was a little Stockholm in North Omaha. There were Hungarian Jews who had moved into North Omaha. All of this diversity wrapped around in the near north side. 1939, look at these black and white photos in the slide. And you can see they are packed with businesses. There's a synagogue. There's other apartment buildings, three, two and three story buildings up and down 24th Street all the way into the 1960s. White flight took its last breath, gaping breath in the 60s when the Fair Housing Act was passed, when the first Omaha rioting happened in 1966 it started to come apart. And today we can see these images from Google Earth of a dead empty North 24th Street at Nicholas on the west side and then on the east side, of course, one large school covering what used to be blocks full of busy and varied buildings that covered housing, that provided jobs and careers, that gave recreation opportunities, religious opportunities, healthcare, that didn't have police brutality in the way that it happens today. Although I've traced police brutality against African-Americans all the way back to 1876 in Omaha, had educational opportunities, government opportunities, culture. Transportation, the social went on. But today what's happening is that more than 21% of the area is considered eligible for revitalization in Omaha. We're gentrified. Now, wait a second. There's something happening here. Oh, the ongoing reality of what African Americans in Omaha face. I put another one of these long laundry lists. I'm not going to read the whole thing. You can take a minute and take a look through it. But you can see that since 2000, the effects of segregation continue to hammer Omaha. In 2007, a corner store owner in East Omaha, an Ethiopian immigrant named Kassan Gassami, he was abducted, bound with duct tape, locked in the basement of his store, and his store building was set on fire. He escaped. The building was completely obliterated after existing there for almost 100 years. In 2014, the Omaha Police Department swarmed onto an African-American man named Octavius Johnson and beat him and several members of his family because they were responding to a parking complaint in his neighborhood. Six officers were fired, but the incident still happened. 2020, James Skurlock was murdered during the George Floyd protests in Omaha. In 2022, Malcolm X was added to the Nebraska Hall of Fame. And in 2022, he became the first ever Black person there, despite the long history of African Americans in Omaha. There are plenty of resources for you to learn more about Nebraska Black history. I am not the right one or the only one. The book that I offer is a place to start as well as my website, NorthOmahaHistory.com. But you can see here the Great Plains Black History Museum, the North Omaha Legacy Tour led by Preston Love Jr. Making Invisible History is Visible is a project of high school historians with OPS. Divisible is an upcoming documentary about redlining in Omaha. African Americans in Nebraska history is a great collection put together by History Nebraska. Just Google it, it comes right up. So there are lots of history resources out there and it's growing all the time. There are great pieces being put together in the community, including by places like Mount Moriah Church on 24th Street has their own history center. 
uh, and several other places in the community. Of course, North Omaha history celebrates Black history all year long because Black history is North Omaha history. So my name is Adam Fletcher Sassy, and uh, it's been my honor to share this with you today. Thank you so much, Adam, Lori, and Ed. All of that information was super significant and very eye-opening to me personally, and I'm sure everyone else agrees. I think I speak for everyone when I say that I wish this type of information was more widely known in and around Nebraska. So thank you for sharing this with us. Just a reminder, if anybody has any last minute questions, I've seen some pop up in the Q&A box, but feel free to put them in the chat now. Um, also, a short poll is going to pop up on your screen. And like I mentioned earlier, we would appreciate having you fill that out. And again, thank you to Adam, Lori, and Ed for sharing all of your knowledge and research with us. Um, and let me get that poll pulled up real quick. Okay, you should be seeing that on your screens. And then as we wait for people to get their questions in, um, I see that you guys have been answering the questions as they've come in, which is very helpful. I did want to revisit one, um, which you kind of touched on, Adam, but someone asked, if you're interested in exploring these issues further, where can we, where can we turn? Particularly curious about housing covenants, this person said, but if you guys have any more um, resources that you'd like to suggest, I'd like to open it up to all of you to share those with us. You know, housing covenants. Are, uh, go ahead. I, I would just echo what Adam said about Palma Strand's um, work, work that has done in Omaha. That is, um, she's done an incredible job pulling that all together. And um, I don't know, Adam, if you have her, I, I don't have her, her uh, information handy or the, the article she's written, but um, that would be something that I would encourage you to do. Yeah, definitely. And I, I do link to Palma's work on the NorthOmahaHistory.com website several times, including under the About page. So go check that out if you want to find more. Um, also, Samika just shared in the chat uh, the Undesigned the Red Line exhibit at UNO. Absolutely phenomenal work uh, and highly, highly recommended. Uh, I will say about housing covenants specifically, extremely hard to find. Uh, I have been on a decade-long quest to find specific language, specific details about housing covenants in Omaha. Uh, I've talked to a lot of homeowners from around different regions of the city. I haven't found a lot yet, but I would highly recommend that if anybody finds those, share, share. Ed, I know that you found some housing covenant work in Lincoln. Lots of them. Um, they're reflected in the National Register nominations I've written for uh, the Boulevards District. Um, and the Brownville district. Um, they're readily available there in the register deeds, uh, but I can point people towards, towards many examples. Thank you guys. Um, I'm seeing a question. What types of health conditions are BIPOC at higher risk for with redlining and other historical injustices? Right now, I'm about question. to I'm, I, I'm yeah. about to put a link to the Omaha Health Equity Timeline by the Douglas County Health Department. Um, I partnered with them along with Noise and a couple other organizations to uh, put this together. But it's a great document, and it answers a lot of that question, both in historical context as well as currently. So I'm going to drop that link in here. Um, you know what I would say about that is again, it really often instead, I mean, obviously there are illnesses that are more common among some um, cultures and races, but at the end of the day, so much of it just comes back to poverty. And regardless of um, uh, the race or ethnicity, if you live in poverty, your likelihood of having um, not only disease, because it's been shown that people who live in poverty who are under the stress of living in poverty are more likely to not only become ill, but have more serious forms of illness, but also because things like, say, for example, not having insurance, being able to access insurance in a timely manner, or healthcare in a timely manner, not having access to healthy foods. Um, one of the things that we're working on here in Lincoln that I'm, I'm particularly um, 
you know, sensitive to is that while we we've done a wonderful job putting food into the community and helping people fill their stomachs. We're not necessarily doing it in a way that's making healthy people healthier. And so, um, you know, the idea of giving people poor food is, you know, in many respects, not solving some of the problems that we really need to solve, which is uh, to create healthier people. So if you're, if you're really thinking about how to do good, um, as an individual, if you're going to donate to the food bank, donate healthy food. If you're going to give a gift to um, a local school that is in a high poverty area, give something that is is creating a healthy lifestyle for them. It's not an, you know, people say, well, their their stomachs are full and you're like, well, that's good. But if your stomachs are full with poor food, it's not really giving them the advantage to be able to, you know, do better and get better. It's, it, ultimately, it just means diabetes, heart disease, um, all of the things that that we work so hard to prevent. So I would just always, that's why I always kind of cycle people back to, yes, there are some illnesses, but at the same time, it really comes down to poverty. And that is at the root of so many things that go wrong. That's just really quick. Oh, sorry, quick shout out to Shamika who just shared the Malcolm X Memorial Foundation also in the chat. So everybody check out their website as well. Powerful, powerful resource. I'm seeing a question from Tony saying, have you done research into digital redlining in these areas? Whoever wants to take that. Uh, digital redlining is a, a depth and concentration that I haven't taken on yet, but I'm going to next. Uh, it's a phenomenal, excellent example. The Northside Teleservices Inc. is building a $80 million uh, facility at 24th and Lake that is under development right now and should go on for the next couple of years. It's going to be a phenomenal structure that will be mixed residential, uh, commercial, and office space, as well as new housing and preserving the historic Webster Telephone Exchange building. Uh, so their work alone is going to boost then and hopefully eliminate that digital red line, but uh, it's definitely ongoing. And it, it, of course, digital redlining extends far beyond home connectivity or cell phone connectivity. It also goes into schools, community organizations and other institutions where young people and adults uh, don't have a lack of, or don't have opportunity because of the lack of digital resources that their access. So, that's definitely worth exploring in the future. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, thank you for asking that question, Tony. That's something I hadn't heard of before, so I'll definitely look into that as well. Um, we've gotten a couple comments. Just thanking you guys for your presentations. Kirsten said, thank you, Lori, and Tony. Oh, sorry, Peggy said, thank you so much for this excellent program. So just wanted to give those a shout out. Um, well, Lilia. I would just say, I would th say thank you, obviously, to my fellow presenters, Adam and Ed. It's always um, it's a pleasure to meet you, Adam, and it's always a pleasure to be, be with you, Ed. But also, Krista, thank you for organizing this. I know um, it's not always easy, and it's not always easy to, to bring these things together. So thanks for keeping us on track and, and um, putting the event together. And to the people who are here, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again. Yeah. Thanks again for doing this, Chris. It's it's an honor to be here. I It's just an honor to hear the information that you guys have brought tonight. I mean, I know that there's a lot more and we're just touching the surface, but it's been great to learn from you. And I could not have, you know, held this event without all of your information. So thank you. Um, Lilia said, what is your outlook about the future of having this information known under the EW Scholarship Opportunity Act? Does anyone know about that? Nope. I'm not sure what EW is. I'm I Lilia, if you want to comment um, with more information, we might be able to answer your question, but otherwise it seems like you've asked us something that we are unaware of. So good job. But sorry that we can't answer your question. I'm seeing um Question that says, do you have data that reflects industry disproportionately housed in poor neighborhoods that contributes to polluted air, water, and contributing to other health issues? 
Uh, Julie, I'm putting a, an answer into that um, with a link to my article on um, lead poisoning in North Omaha. It has different data sources and a couple of very specific things in response to your question. So you'll, you might appreciate that. And, and we've been looking at the lead issue is the first thing that comes to mind here too, obviously found in older homes, um, um, which tend to be among people of color or low income populations that have higher lead um, piping and and um, chance of lead poisoning. So that's something I know we're working on. Uh, I think one of the areas there we need to really work hard on is bringing together the public health and kind of the environmental side of things. I mean, it, on one hand, it's kind of a, um, a pipes and infrastructure issue. On the other hand, it's a public health and, and um, uh, medicine issue. And sometimes bringing those two together is really hard, but I know our health, local health department is working on doing that. And so um, um, I also know that I was recently on the committee that the mayor here in Lincoln had in order to uh, select a new water source. Uh, Lincoln is in search of its second water source to bring water to our community. And it was really, I was really pleased that part of that was to look at the impact of, um, of that process, not only building it, but um, um, determining where to put it and how to pay for it and the impact that would have on vulnerable populations. So thinking about if we build this, will it increase water rates? Um, will it go across indigenous lands? I mean, all of those kinds of things were part of that process, which in years past has not been the case. So um, I was excited to see that. In Omaha, they've used uh, the, the, the lead remediation effort and lots of its predecessor work in terms of quote, urban renewal, and other pieces like that as an excuse to tear down historic structures in the African-American neighborhood. So there's a catch-22 that's involved here between the built environment and the effects of industrial pollutants and the potential for historical preservation, especially in um, discrim uh, discriminated communities, uh, marginalized communities, particularly in low-income African-American communities. Do we tear down the buildings in the name of building new anti-lead? facilities or do we work with what's already there to preserve and conserve what we can ed of course would know a lot more about that than me but for the sake of saying it there's a lot of overlap here and this goes back to that question of intersectionality as it goes to this analysis it's deep on every level um if anyone else has any questions we've just got a couple minutes left so feel free to drop them in the chat but i appreciate all of the links that we've got going in the chat um i know i've been copying in them and pasting them so that i have them after this presentation ends but it's not just been panelists who have been you know sharing those it's been attendees as well so i appreciate everyone sharing their knowledge and the resources that they have this is you know this what these kind of events are for is just giving us space so that we can all share information together. So I appreciate everyone's help. With Marissa, that. there was a comment in the chat from Roger Dorr. Will the resources mentioned tonight be shared with us? What's your dissemination? Yes, I was going to mention that. So um, usually if uh, we have great presentations like yours, like we did tonight, we um, share them with people a couple weeks afterwards. Um, since we'll have, you know, a few long presentations from tonight, we can, um, I think, get them uploaded in a Google folder for you guys and then give attendees access to that. So um, we've got all your emails from your attendance tonight, so we can reach back out to you about how you can access that um, in a week or two.